Hello, good morning. So we'll start our section today with uh, Ivo Sachs from Munich, and he's talking about our, our field for the RNS World Lab. Uh, this one, all right, thank you. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's, I'm very, very glad to be here. I think it's a really nice workshop. I'm really enjoying the, the interaction and the talk. It's, it's really good. On or? Seems. I I, I, uh? <laughs> it's already I'm off, I think. It's I, a, I like the setup. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it's, okay. yeah. OK. <laughs> All right, so now the talk today is, is with Eugenia Bofo, who is right there in the middle. She's at Charles University in, in Prague, so welcome. And the, uh, the, the question we wanted to address is, can we somehow couple Ramon Ramon fields to the RNS word line? Now, um, the motivation for it is perhaps uh, easily given because uh, there is this whole problem of how to couple um, Ramon Ramon fields to the RNS string. Uh, of course, there has been a way to overcome it with this using the pure spinner formulation. Um, so, so this in, in some sense it parallels a little bit to, to some extent, but it doesn't appear to be quite the same, the same thing. Uh, it's a little bit more, perhaps more bottom up. It's really what we try to do is we start with the RNS uh, word line and then we sort of massage it a little bit in a way that uh, the the Ramon Ramon uh, fields will, will are able are able to appear. Now, of course, it would be better to do this in string theory than on the word line. That would be a much better thing to do. But what we've learned a little bit over the last few years is that many aspects of uh, string theory can be already seen with the word line. And so therefore, we thought we would start with the word line and see how far we can get. So this will be part of the motivation a little bit here. Will come. So just to go through the program quickly. So this is um, yeah. So this motivation of the gift. And so we will, if we want to couple the Ramon Ramon fields, our way is somehow we want to do it through the spin fields because the spin fields appear naturally in the, as a vertex operator in the Ramon Ramon field. So the first problem will be to define something analog to a spin field on the word line, which is perhaps the biggest challenge in some sense. And then we can study the BRSD cohomology once we've done that, and we'll find indeed that some Ramon Ramon fields can be there. And then we want to deform uh, the theory by Ramon Ramon fields and see if we can get some nonlinear uh, interactions, a nonlinear theory, uh, which is based on Ramon Ramon backgrounds. And on the way of doing all this, we will start with the word line, but on the way we kind of forget the word line. And at the end, we want to see if we somehow can come back and have a word line interpretation of what we are actually doing. So that is the, the program. And I should say that this whole topic for me is, is quite, um, how to say, probably many things here don't make too much sense, or I'm not sure they make sense. So I, I'm actually relying on you a little bit also helping you through this talk. So because it's really uh, a little bit off of what I'm uh, sometimes it's not quite what so so simple for me to understand everything we did. And maybe some things have already been done or not well defined. So please interrupt at any time. So let me come back to the to the motivation. So the, the way I like to think about string field theory these days is as a theory of background field. So not so much as a perturbative expansion in terms of q psi q plus psi cubed plus psi four plus psi blah, blah, blah. So some expansion, but rather as a, um, a background field which appears in the BRSD charge and the equation of motion should come out of the condition that the BRSD charge is nil potent. And so that's one way uh, to approach uh, string field theory. Of course, it's in field theory we understand quite well what this means. Normally, when we do BRSD quantization, what does it mean that the BRSD charge squares to zero? It means we can decouple the longitudinal modes mm -hmm. or the pure gauge modes. So that means we can be decoupled because of this exactness. So we can have a cohomology. So if you take, for instance, Young-Mills theory or gravity, uh, you can 
you can decouple the longitudinal gravitons precisely when the background satisfies the Einstein equations. Otherwise, you cannot. And so being able to decouple the, gravi the longitudinal modes is essentially equivalent of saying the background has to satisfy the nonlinear field equation. And that's really the idea which is behind this. So we say we would like to be RSD charge um, to uh, do square to zero is that we are able to decouple longitudinal modes, which amounts to imposing the field equation. So that is what we, the idea behind here, you say. So this should imply some equations, which uh, some function of uh, some differential operators and the fields that has to be equal to zero. So that's the, that's somehow the philosophy underlying this whole, this whole topic. Um, well, so here, okay. Um, so the, the question was, how is this related? Or if this is true of the Fisher Susskind mechanism. So here, indeed, I mean, I should say all of this, what I'm doing is three levels, so it's classical, I don't do loops. So then the Fisher Susskind doesn't talk to me yet. <laughs> but you're right, of course, it's there. Then you would have to do, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what? What I was going to say. Yeah, so then, of course, this is always has to be specified a little bit. When we say the BRST operator squares to zero, um, one usually has to say acting on something. Yeah, so just saying, one can also impose that the BRST operator has an algebra, just as a Lie algebra element, because uh, we have the brackets, so we squares to zero, but that's usually too strong. Usually that imposes that all fields have to be equal to zero. So usually what one really means is BRSD operator squares to zero acting on a suitable vector space or representation space. And that one has to specify a little bit and depending on what specification one takes, one can get different results. So I'll perhaps comment on that quickly at some point. So a, a, a prominent example of where this worked, for instance, is in the pure Spinner formulation. There was uh, Berkowitz and Howe had a paper many years ago that where they precisely recovered the nervous schwartz um, the Neve Schwarz, Neve Schwarz uh, field equations for the string by imposing the pure Steiner BRSD charge squares to zero. So that was one, one example of this. Yes. Yeah, and then it's nice because it's uh, explicitly supersymmetric, so they, they got the whole Sugira equation also. Uh, um, in the, the, well, they might be in the, so you see, this is the first instance of maybe my gap. So the paper I know they had explicitly not the Dileton and not the Ramon Ramon, but it's quite possible that it's there and I'm just not aware of it, that they also got this. So this is something perhaps yeah. we should discuss. I think I, I know only one paper with Berkowitz and how, and there they derived the full okay, linearized equation motion for them. The linearized, yeah, linearized, of course. No, no, but I'm sorry. talking about the nonlinear. Full, full equation motion. You get a super space representation. Yeah, okay, so very good. So you see, so even more. Yeah. Very good. So, so that's precisely the hope of this talk that I learned something too. That's right. Yeah, it's yeah. So this was pushed also in the beginning of string filter a little bit, but but the thing is, of course. Um, the, the the problem with this approach generally is that, uh, especially in the RNS formulation, actually constructing the BRST operator off shell is a tricky thing because if the Virasoro, you don't have a Virasoro algebra, if the theory is not conformal, you don't have a Virasoro algebra, so you don't really, it's not so clear how to construct the BRST operator off shell. Um, so that is, uh, so usually what one does in the RNS formulation is rather one takes uh, the equations of motion by extracting the beta function of the, com the world sheet conformal field theory and saying the beta function has to be equal to zero. That's one way. Or the other way is you compute S matrix elements and you find a, um, a um, an effective action which reproduces this S matrix. And so that's the sort of textbook approach to finding equation motion. Now, um, here I'm, I will, in, in what follows, I will no longer write QBRSD, but uh, just QB uh, to keep it short, or sometimes just Q. So it's just, and by BRSD, it's really the word sheet BRSD operator, uh, so which are the word line BRSD operator. So I take a word line, I BRSD quantize it, and imposing that the BRSD operator, that word line uh, BRSD quantization squares to zero means that particle can propagate in this background, so I can identify it as a particle, and therefore it has to be on shell. Mm, so that's really the idea. 
Uh, so, as I said before, one can impose this condition as a function of the background field for the world line uh, in the RNS. And indeed, for instance, in this way, one can uh, obtain Young Mills equation of motion that has been done by um, Siegel, uh, Dai, Wang in 2008, I think. Uh, similarly, if you work in N equal four world line in the RNS, you can extract from this condition the Einstein equations or the Einstein delet. In fact, the whole low energy bosonic part of the supergravity equations are already contained in the world line. So we don't need string theory to full string theory. The world line already encodes all this information. Uh, and that's one way to extract it. Um, again, one can actually fine tune things. When I was saying this QB has to square to zero on a suitable representation space, depending on what space you take, you can get only Einstein, you can get. Um, okay, this would take, a, maybe I would prefer to explain or discuss it a little bit later, but it is, it's much similar to actually what you do in the string is you do some of you break, you take any go forward and you break the R symmetry. And then you can you couple it through the field strength, not through the potential, much in the same way as you couple the the, the spin connection. Actually, it's very similar. So spin connection and Halbramon field strength are almost on the same level, apart from one breaks the R symmetry and the other not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry, it's always the super word line. It's always, so for n equal zero word line, you get nothing. n equal one word line, you get three fermions. n equal two, you get young mills. n equal four, you get gravity, etc. And n equal six, I don't know. Maybe you get higher spin, but I never tried. So I think that would be nice to find out. And uh, yeah, so just depending on how you restrict the Hilbert space here on which the Q acts, which uh, is some analog to level truncation, uh, level matching and so in string theory, you can get either, you can project out the Calbremont field. You can, this is like the, orient, uh, the or, uh, unoriented string. You can project out the dilaton. You can project out various fields. For instance, you can have only Einstein by suitably restricting uh, the, the, the vector space. But that is, um, not the topic today, that's uh, an older stuff. So the question really, which, um, which came about here is, could we repeat this for the Ramon fields? And now, of course, the first question is, how would you even couple Ramon Ramon fields to the, to the word line, to the RNS word line? And here, um, the, the way uh, usually this is done in string theory, we know we do this through the spin fields. So we use the string fields, uh, the, sp the spin fields up here, explicitly in the construction of the vertex operator for the Ramon Ramon fields, uh, and also for the Ramon fields. Of course. So here is just a, a quick review. So what do we do? We take the vertex operator for say a fermion uh, um, is, is, is contains a spin field, which amounts, which, which arises from the bosonization of the, which arises naturally in the bosonization of the world sheet fermion, right? So we take the world sheet fermion with something like e to the h, and we take some fact e to the one half h. Hmm? We take the square root of the fermion. And then of course we have many fermions. So that we have in fact four fermions in the critical string in four complex fermions. And so this defines then the, 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 Ramond, Ramond, uh, the Ramond vacuum depending on all the signs you take plus a half minus a half. This is the usual text. Now, the, the point here I would like to make is, or there's nothing deep here at all, is just to remind you what would happen if you try to do this in a non-critical string, so in string theory in four dimensions, for instance. Then you wouldn't have, um, because each of these vertex operators has conformal weight, uh, I think one over 16. So you have, um, uh, so then you have four of them in, in the string. So it gives you the right thing so that the, the two point function goes like one over Z which is what you need to have the right commutation relation through the contour integral. But if you had a non-critical string, say in four dimensions, the last two would be missing, then the correlation function wouldn't go like one over z, but one over square root z. And then you wouldn't have uh, a well-defined contour integral. And you couldn't really define properly what you mean by commutator, right? Because the contour integral would have a branch cut. Yeah, right. Disposonized, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So uh, why am I saying this? This is not really uh, what we're doing here, but just to, to motivate a little bit that 
in string theory, somehow things are a little bit fine tuned that this all this works with the spin fields. So it nicely the algebra closes. We have we actually have a Lie algebra of the vertex operator. Yeah, this would be the yeah yeah SO8 manifest. Um, so I'm saying this because on the word line we will have a similar complication: is that we don't have bosonization on the line. And we cannot do bosonize a fermion on the word line. So we don't really, we won't be able to just copy this prescription of just saying we write a word line fermion as an e to the one half phi or e to the phi or e to the h. So we need to think of something else. And I'm just saying, so then when, when I'll do this, you'll probably say this makes not too much sense. I'm probably you're right. But I just want to say it's a sort of a little bit a similar situation with the rise if you were working with string theory in non critical dimension. We have something analog or equivalent to vertex operators. So we have an operator state correspondence on the word line, uh, which goes through a deformation of the BSD charge. But this I will actually have explicitly on none of the slides. I, I know it's a little bit weird, but and when you think about it later, you, you will not find it so weird anyway. But yeah, initially it sounds a little bit unusual. So, so that's what, just what I wanted to say, that if you were in string theory in non-critical dimension, you wouldn't easily get a vertex operator algebra, wouldn't naturally, easily, naturally build a, a Lie or Poisson algebra. So you'd have, to, you'd have to think of something else. And as I was said, we, we will actually have a similar thing to deal with. And this is really just as a motivation, so you, don't, you hopefully won't find it too, too um, absurd of what we're doing. Okay, now let me... Um, actually have a quick review of this, this work of uh, Dai Yuan and Siegel is the one where I learned all these things actually. Um, and so this is the n equal two word line. So in terms of string word sheet, you can think what you do is you truncate the word sheet to the psi one, you take the n equal one super string, the open string, and you um, take only the psi one half and the psi minus a half. So you level truncate at the psi one half. And then these translate into the psi and the psi bar, which give you the n equal two word line. Um, so then, okay, you do the usual thing. You write the word line, you do BRSD quantization of the word line, and you, you end up with a BRSD operator, which is uh, the C ghost, the uh, word line reparameterization invariance. Then you have the P squared, just momentum squared. You have a super ghost, the two super ghosts, which go with the two supersymmetry transformations, and these are the supercharges. And so you have the Q, which is psi mu Q mu, in string is just psi mu dx mu. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Q bar, which is the Psi bar, which is uh, represented as a derivative hmm. on, on the representation space. So then you have the wave functions on which this BRSD operator acts is bound by functions which depend on X, obviously, the, the, the C ghost, the gamma ghost, the beta ghost, and the TW. mu. And the, so these, these are like, um, you know, wave function in quantum mechanics doesn't depend on P mu, it depends on X if you are in the position space representation. Similarly, it depends not on gamma bar because gamma bar is a derivative with respect to beta and beta bar is a derivative with respect to gamma. So it only depends on these variables. And so this is the straightforward. Um, and te sorry, theta should be a psi. I forgot I had it changed in the middle of the talk and then forgot to fix it here. So Thank you for pointing it out. So this should be the psi mu. Well, yeah, so, uh, yeah, in, in, indeed. So one has to define a suitable inner product with this. And, um, okay, this perhaps, I think I will not say anything about it in this talk, but you, you can, you have to do, you, you can do it, but you have to, uh, yeah, use some delta function, basically, in there. So, now comes the operator state correspondence for Ted. So now what I can do is I can take this cube, this BRSD operator, and I can deform it by background fields. That means everywhere where I have a P mu, I take a covariant derivative, right? They're just minimal coupling to a young Mills field. So then that gives me a deformation, which I denote by delta Q. It's just the deformation is the, ex the first term in the expansion in the background fields to which I couple this field. And then I act with this delta Q on the young Mills. I mean, this is the, okay, the beta is one particular wave function. It's like a reference state. It's like the SL2 vacuum. In, so beta is the reference state and we're acting with delta Q on this, you will obtain the young Mills state. So in, in, in this particular theory. So uh, in, in, 
Delta Q is the vertex operator, yeah. And it's the deformation of the BLSD charge. It's the deformation. So just what you do, you take, you know, in, in the world line sheet, we do the same thing, right? We take the world sheet, we deform it by background fields. The first term usually gives you the vertex operator apart for the Dilat zone and the Le Monde Monde fields. But for the Neve Schwarz fields, usually just the deformation of the world sheet already shows you what the vertex operator is in a suitable picture. And, and here's the same. You don't deform the world sheet line, you could, but what you deform is the BSD operator when you quantize the world line in in this in this background so that leads to the form brsd operator and uh, this is the deformation of the brsd operator that's right you, you. Mm -hmm. that, that's right you could in in this particular case uh, you could just say you 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 add these background fields to the word line action and you redo the BRSD procedure, it would come to the same thing. Uh, the, well, sometimes, for instance, for the dilaton, that doesn't work. Uh, for the dilaton, what I'm trying to say here is that there are more ways to deform this BRSD operator than there are to deform the action. So some of this deformation of the BRSD operator cannot be obtained as from, from the action, if you just think of, yeah, exactly. So it gives you a little bit more freedom. And this is, for instance, the case for the for the dilaton. The dilaton did not arise through the formation of the action. So anyway, so here is the the operator state correspondence in this particular case. So this is actually all described in in Siegel and um, in this paper, and also I think in, in I saw some uh, Warren Siegel's uh, uh, lecture notes when he teaches string theory. I think he also does it like this. And so this is this is really not my uh, my invention. It's this is from him. So, okay, and now what they then had in principle, indeed, now they do this thing, you impose QB, QB equals zero on a suitable uh, restriction of the, of the Hilbert space, and then pops out the nonlinear Young Mills equations. And so that is one example of how uh, the, the Young Mills theory comes out as a theory of background fields for the word line propagating in some Young Mills background. So, this is somehow the setting. Now, um, here, so as I said before, you can repeat this for n equal four, then you get in the same way you get Einstein and all that, Einstein, um, Einstein, Dilaton, and again, vertex operator for the Dilaton by deformation of the cube. Exactly, yeah. Uh, can be can be in the young Mills case it's 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 uh, up to second order in Einstein is more because the for instance the, the you know the deformation how to say the um, uh, what happens is that the Q depends on 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 the the fearbein and the fearbein involves the metric and also depends on the inverse of the fearbein so it, it depends actually it's nonlinear in the metric. If you expand it, so you really get the full non full nonlinear equations in that way. <clears throat> oh, very good. Um, this is a a, 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 um, a very good question, which I don't really have an answer to. We try, we played with this in a in a paper with um, Maxim Grigoriev and Adrian Meyer. We we tried to precisely play this game, and. Uh, it, it, so the mot so the idea goes back to this very old idea of perhaps uh, Stroming uh, Horowitz and Stroming. I remember they had this background. They were suggesting a, a background independent uh, cubic string theory by just taking s is equal phi cubed. Right? And here one can try something else. You can try to define s as being a trace of q cubed. The trace would be over the algebra of the BRSD, the BRSD, but we never quite managed to do it. Instead, what we were able to do is replace this trace by just something basically this beta. And this, you can vary for Maxwell, this works. For Young Mills, it didn't quite work. So it's not really fulfilled, but it, it's that sort of the, the hope that something like this one could arise. We yeah, if we take the full trace, it's too strong. 
we, we get no no equations and no no fields anymore so so we really in order to get young meals we have to restrict the trade but you lose cyclicity of course by doing this and this is what uh what spoils it i know it's just um what um what you get from here well yeah this is also true in general q squared equals zero is too strong but if you restrict it on a super suitable vector space which you you could uh, call level truncation in string theory then it precisely gives young mills theory um, yeah but even even that is even that is too strong so the problem is if i do this i still get too strong uh, equations um if, if essentially yeah so it yeah probably you're right um i i don't really have a good understanding of it we, 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 we played with it and we yeah and anyway so maybe there is a, a good answer here but we haven't found it yet q is just i take uh, you know what the, the approach here is you take some background gravitational young mills whatever and you want to see can a part can i define a particle in this background which amounts to the thing as a word line can be quantized and you can decouple the longitudinal degrees um so so we take is we take a word line put it in an arbitrary background try to be rsd quantize it for the BRSD, for the word line you can always do it but typically the BSD operator you get in this way will not square to zero. And then you say that BSD operator, I want it to square to zero for this word line. And that implies some equations on the background set. So that's uh, true. By Q. Oh, Q is just because when you vary it, you get, you know, then you could say if this is the action, then you take delta S is trace delta Q, Q squared, plus of course the other terms. And then this can be arbitrary. So then Q squared would have to be zero. So that is sort of the idea behind it. It's true. When yeah that, that's right yeah so you could weaken it perhaps yeah that's true i mean i think this is something that uh, still perhaps there's a story there to to tell but we haven't really gotten to the bottom of it yet but that would be somehow a wish that this would be string field theory like something like this and then you just say you vary right um but uh, yeah. so Okay, so now, so that was the thing. So now, as I said, for, for uh, that uh, n equals two word line, you get young meals in this way, n equals four, you get gravity and so on. But um, now what about Ramon Ramon? So for this, I return to the n equal one word line first. And I try to do not first Ramon Ramon, but just Ramon, so just the fermion. And then of course, again, I'm not telling you anything new. What you do is you take in the Ramon sector, you just keep the zero mode of the word sheet, which is now the Psi. And that's the n equal one word line. And we know in the nickel one line, the wave function is of the form phi alpha alpha, where alpha is some state, right? It's, um, it's some uh, Dirac spinner. And you know, here again, one may ask the question, do we have an operator state corresponds? Can we write the state alpha as delta Q on something? And in string theory, we can, right? We act with the spin fields on the nervous schwartz vacuum, and we get the branch cut, and we get the the Ramon state. So in string theory, we do this with the spin field. So this job is done. Now that is, we want to somehow mimic this on the word line. Now here, we, from here, here on, we will work in four dimensions. Just we, for some reason, we started in four dimensions. We probably shouldn't have, but we, we did. Um, um, and we try to repeat this bosonization. So now we have just alpha and alpha dot and the uh, uh, notation. Okay. So now comes what we call bosonization is we write the psi mu, this thing, we write it as a theta times poly matrix times a lambda. So we, this should be somehow the square root, but uh, you know, doesn't work of course, because you cannot, you don't have fractional statistics in one dimension. So what we do is we take lambda to be bosonic 
So Grassman even and theta to be Grassman odd. So you write it as a Grassman even times Grassman odd. But then, of course, we've introduced new fields. We have to postulate some commutation relations. And the commutation relation which we postulate is that um, the lambda, oh sorry, I didn't write it here, but actually that lambda is the same as derivative with respect to, to delta, to theta. But this, of course, cannot be right because lambda is bosonic, theta is fermionic. So we introduce a shift operator whose sole purpose is to change the Grassmann parity. So we just say we introduce a new operator in the algebra, which has this job. Mm -hmm. So now we have our algebra, which was the psi and the x, and so on. We replace it by, again, x and p. But we add also theta alpha, lambda, and the shift operator. But what you then find, uh, so this is really the shift. It changes the Grassmann parity. And we took it to be uh, <coughs> mod 2. So if you do it twice, you get, again, the identity. I think, again, that could be probably relaxed a little bit. But for now, let's do it. No. No, so this I will come back at the very end. I'll try to write an action. Not only can I not write an action, it doesn't even form this, this extended PLSD algebra doesn't even form a Lie algebra. So you can easily see that if you try to, for instance, assume uh, some reasonable commutation relation of theta with, uh, with the shift, it, the Jacobi identity is not fulfilled. So now, of course, then you will not be surprised we don't have a word line action. So it's not even a Lie algebra. Then you could say, okay, that's it. But that is why I gave this motivation at the beginning. I said, if you did string theory in non-critical dimensions, spin field also wouldn't form a, <laughs> a Lie algebra. So I said, maybe, you know, let's, let's see, can we still work with this? Uh, it's, it's more or less what we do, actually. It's just sort of, you know, goes between two vector spaces. Oh, you mean like a, like a, just a, like like when you do supersymmetry, just like um, a number or sort of well, maybe. Then it would go uh, to zero, yeah, and it would commute, yeah. Then I would have then I would have a Lie algebra. If it's squares to zero, I'd be good. Yeah, I don't want that. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, sure. Oh, when you say curiosity, it means usually a very difficult question, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So it, I, I think, I mean, this is, uh, as I said, when I said at the beginning, this is somehow explorative, and uh, maybe very, still very far from the ultimate truth. So I'm, I'm very much taking in any, every comment which I get here in, from this, uh, it's all noted. And then maybe I will cite you in the next, time. maybe, maybe. I'll. So um, anyway, so it seems like it's not, it's not uh, a Lie algebra, but then is it so bad? Hmm? And um, so what I said, well, here it's just summarized again. So we impose on this algebra, these relations, the theta alpha, theta beta um, anti-commutator is, is zero, but, um, and the theta alpha lambda is equal to the shift. Mm -hmm. And that's the only relations. No, no relations between shift and, shift and lambda also commutes, by the way. Oh, this I didn't write, I should have written. Shift and lambda is uh, supposed to commute. That's right, that's right. Exactly, you know, this is also the way it's, it's like, it, it, again, also with the spin fields, if you're not in critical dimension, somehow you go on the next sheet, right? It's on the next Riemann sheet and you cannot really compare it. I agree. So it's not, it's not, um, it, yeah, we can, we can live without it. In fact, that is what we, what we do here is um, what we now do is we now define the wave function alpha stream just being the linear function theta alpha, just like um, uh, so. So the constant function in some sense would be the Neville Schwartz perhaps vacuum, and then theta alpha is just this. And now, of course, in order to see if this is all consistent, you have to make sure that the psi mu's, which were defined here at the very beginning, you know, just go back quickly. Uh, here, this size, they have to satisfy a Clifford algebra, right? In the, in the quantization of the nickel one particle, the psi mu, psi mu should satisfy a form a Clifford algebra. So you have to check this, otherwise you have a problem. And in general, the psi mu, 
built as a square out of this t and lambda will not form a Clifford algebra. But if you restrict it on one particle states of this type, it does. So this is an example where you see again this restriction. You always have to act. So it's not th this theory only works if you act on something. You know, it's not a, the Lie algebra per se, but it's really an associative algebra which acts on some vector space. And if this vector space is nice enough, you have some properties. And that is what we do here. So we say the wave functions, which are uh, of, of this form, which are linear in theta, on such wave functions, it does actually form a Clifford algebra. Then you can do the standard quantization. And indeed, you now build, again, this PRST operator, where you now, the Q, remember the Q is this, and you take the square root of this psi. I mean, you resolve this psi in terms of lambda and theta. And these are um, the wave functions, and you get the usual cohomology, which is just a Dirac equation. Mm -hmm. So everything is fine. So this is one way of doing um, three fermions. Um, it, it, the thing is, you have to always, you have to, yes, if you restrict on these states, it does, it does form a Lie algebra. If you restrict on these states, it does form a Lie algebra. Yeah. Okay, so that is some sort of uh, a warm up to see if, if this makes any sense. And it, in, in some uh, context, it, it seems to be okay. So um, now what I'd like to do is I would like to make the theory a little bit smaller. And this goes a little bit in the, in the, in the Berkowitz way. It's sort of certainly inspired in some sense is that, uh, or at least there's many analogs is that if you write my supercharge, which was this psi, um, remember this was the psi, okay, let me go back just to, it was a little bit quick, um, to the, where is it? Where did we take the, bo here is the bosonization. We write the psi mu as a wave spin, so this combination. So you could say you could also just take half of it. Suppose we only take half of it and we look at just the half of it by itself, yes. Is there any column? No, it's not the no space time supersymmetry in this theory. No space time. Uh, so, what I want to do now is I want to restrict a little bit further. Is I want to only take half of, only, only take the chiral piece, only this piece. And I want to follow that theory. So, what I want to do is, um, yeah, so I, I decompose the, the, the Q into a chiral and an antichiral piece, uh, which is this piece and this piece. And what happens is that the Q plus Q bar is not a nilpotent operator. That's why you need the Hamiltonian in the BRST charge. But Q, this, this Q itself is separately nilpotent and the Q bar is separately nilpotent. So you can reduce a little bit this theory. Mm -hmm. So you can say, okay, let's only look at the supercharges themselves and consider them uh, as nilpotent operators. And then you could look at the cohomology of, of this little Q is just the chiral part of the supercharge in the BRSD operator. So let me write this perhaps again here. It's just because this is perhaps a little bit messy. Um, so we have the, the BRSD charge is C times the Hamiltonian plus gamma um, Q in the n equal one plus B gamma gamma bar, and now you write this Q as Q, let me write it cold space Q plus cold space Q bar in the above way. And then what you find is this operator itself is also nilpotent. And furthermore, the cohomology of this thing is actually the same as the cohomology of, of, of this operator here. here. So this probably for those who looked at the uh, pure spinner rings a bell sometimes is, is sometimes useful to throw away this quadratic piece and things are a bit simpler, but it's, it's just um, an observation. So then you could say, if you're just interested in describing free fermions, you might as well take just uh, this little Q as a BRST operator. Of course, then you might say, what does it describe? What is, what does it, In some sense, yeah. Yeah. 
Exactly, exactly. And then we can ask, so, so and, the, and so it turns out in some sense it's a bit more natural because what happens, by the way, is, is, is kind of curious, what happens if, if you consider um, this operator just, so in the cohomology, um, okay, how should I say, in the cohomology, we get the, the Dirac equation, or the Weyl equation rather, d chi equals zero, so that's the, the usual, and the antichiral sector uh, becomes exact, it's, it's, it's too exact. So you can restrict to the chiral sector, rather than a Dirac fermion, you just describe a Weyl fermion, if you, if, you, if you go down to here. So that's why we call it the, the chiral theory. And then you can ask, can I deform? Now we come, to, so, so far we've just bosonized the usual um, n equal one word line fermion with this trick. And now we ca uh, can ask, can we deform? Can we introduce background fields? Can we, now we can start about talking about deformations of this BLC operator, little q, or BLC like operator, little q. And this is one that would be uh, very familiar. It's just that would just arise if you couple the word line to an external Yamir field. So you have the, the charged particle propagates in the Yamir field. Then you would have gotten that. It's just this is the Yamir field. Mm -hmm. So nothing new. It's a small parameter, just some, some small parameter. To, to, yeah, I should have written it here. It's just some small parameter. So this is the familiar coupling to a Yamir field of the word line that would show up in this way. But now, because we resolved this fermion, we have new couplings that we can introduce. We could also introduce such a coupling, and these are, this is not the same. And you could introduce such a coupling in the BLC. It's just something you can couple with the BSD operator. Just like in, in, in the string, if you want the moment you have spin fields, you can couple background fields to these spin fields. And that's effectively what we do. We couple background fields to this, what we would call spin field. And that's possible because we have new indices. We didn't have a, 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 um, lower, a, a Dirac index before, but, or a while, but now we do. And then you can say, okay, apparently in this formulation, there's a new class of background fields which I can couple, by which I can deform my BLSD operator. Yeah, if you can, it can be non-abelian. Can be there, doesn't matter. I mean, it's linear. So linear makes no, no. No, um, the, 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 the color indices, these would act on the representation space. These would act as matrices. You know, the Psi is an operator, or the Q is an operator that acts on the representation space, and the gluon or the, the, the quark sits in the, is a state. Uh, the Q becomes, the Q becomes color, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, where was I? Yeah, so this is the usual coupling. Now, but then we said we can also introduce new coupling. You could say, what would happen if I switch on such a field? Not knowing what it is, it's just apparently there. Let's switch it on. So, for instance, if I switch on such a field, you'll find that the anti chiral uh, part of the, of the Fermi is just forced to zero by the, by the, by the, the, um, the how do you say, if you, if you impose now this little q phi equals zero, it just sets the anti chiral part of the fermion to zero. So it just gives like a mask. Or, okay, it's just an observation. We'll see, we come back to it later whether that is. If you switch on um, this, uh, this deformation, you'll find that you no longer have this type of equations, but you get something like this plus d twiddle of say phi twiddle equals zero. So you start mixing the two chiral indices, just rotating the chiral space. That's what these deformations do. Um, okay, so that in itself, I'm not sure, maybe there's an interpretation that would be uh, perhaps good to see. Would you already be able to say from this observation that this has something to do with the Ramon Ramon field that you're switching on? So for it, I don't know actually, maybe one of you knows the answer. If I, um, in a world sheet theory, I switch on the Ramon de Ramon field, what happens to um, n equal one string to, to the fermions on, on, uh, on the D brain? Yeah, so you have a, an, 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 uh, you have a, 
uh, a, a type two theory, turn on the Ramon Dermont field, and then you have a D brain on it. And on this, you have propagating quarks. How does it affect the quarks? If I mean, how do quarks couple to the Ramon Dermont field? That is a question. I think this answer must be known. I don't know the answer, but I'm sure it's known. You know, good. No? Okay. <laughs> uh, so you're considering all these deformations. Why isn't there a deformation with uh, two chiral indices, like A, beta, gamma, for example? This one? Yeah, but without the dots. I'm sorry? Without the dots. Just uh, Oh, that you um that one you could you can also consider this deformation. And now let me try to remember what happens. It would be um it would be I think it would be the following thing. What it does if you switch on this deformation without dots, what it happens is that it takes the this chi off shell. So you, you lose an you know, the, the, the wild fermion becomes off shell. So, so you have no longer any equation. So, so I'm not sure what, how to interpret it. Um, so, okay. And, um, and it's also no longer, yeah, and the, 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 it will no longer be nilpotent, also the operator. So that would also be. For instance, you can switch on this deformation and it doesn't destroy nilpotency of the operator. That's just saying, the statement that the fermion can propagate in any young Mills background. You, the fermion doesn't need the young Mills background to be on shell in order to propagate on it. So this is well known. But so this 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 deformations here, I will later interpret this as a Ramon Dermont field, uh, one form field. Um, and if this is correct, it should be that in fact, um, and this is not this is a something that, as I said, in principle, I should know this, but I don't, that if you switch on the Ramon de Mond uh, one form field, um, that it would um, set half of the fermions, it will force half of the fermions to be zero. Yeah. Um, of course, this is in four dimensions. One would have to repeat this exercise in 10 dimensions to see exactly how it can compare to string theory. But uh, this, this has probably answered, this has an answer, but I just don't know it. Um, it's so it, it's not so much, I think, a charge in the sense that you see here I, I, I denoted it by a vector, poten a vector potential like because it's really uh, like Young Mills vector potential that couples to quarks, whereas here it's more like you couple through the field strength. So it's more, it's a coupling of the field strength to uh, the particle, not through a vector potential. So it's not in a, it's not a U1 charge. Yeah, that's right. But ah, this I have no idea. So yeah, this I don't know. I don't know. actually for this I would have to go into the n equal four theory probably, because that's where the gravity sits. Actually, yeah, maybe we come back to this. I don't know the answer already, but it's uh, maybe we can discuss it a bit more. Anyway, so this is just the, so it gives you a little bit of a glimpse of what happens if you if you resolve these fermions. You, it opens up a little bit bigger field space and it has some effects. You know, it sets depending on what you switch on, which background fields you switch on, you 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 affect the fermionic sector of this theory. So, but now that's really not what was the the motivation. The motivation initially was to find the Ramon Dermont fields in the spectrum. So now what we're looking for is we're looking for two particle states, no longer one particle state. Because you can take a spin field, but you can also take two spin fields or three spin fields. So here we're looking for two particle states that are of this type. So zero is just a constant function. And uh, you can take this type. And you see, normally you would say these things, if there was a, a simple commutation relation between shift and theta, you could reduce this, but we don't. Because it's just an associative culture here. And a, a, a subspace of the two particle states, which is invariant under this psi nu, this word line fermion, is given, is spanned by this, and there's an antichiral part of the same type. And then you just write down the most general wave function you can write down in this subspace, and again, you impose that is in the kernel of this, this PLSD operator here, or this PLSD like operator. Um, and we write it like this. So this is the general ansatz. You find that half of it is exact. So the antichiral piece here is Q exact. So in the cohomology is, is uh, trivial. And this half has to satisfy this equation, has to, has to be closed and co-closed. 
in order to be in the kernel, actually in the cohomology. And um, this is, of course, what we expect for the mon mon fields, bigger field strengths that should be closed and called closed. So this is, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it should, yeah. So, so, so note we don't have vector potentials here. Right? So we really the, the object that arises is, is is the field strengths themselves, not the vector potential. But this is also the case in string theory. Right? The vector, the, the vertex operator for the Mondo field gives you um, um, first a, uh, a field strength. So. So in that sense, you could say this looks right. We could interpret these fields here. This is a one form. This is a two form as uh, something which we will define as the Mondelman fields. It satisfies these equations. OK. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. But that's, that's what one finds. Um, yeah. No, no space-time supersymmetry here. No. Yeah, I just look at the vector space. I can take one particle states, two particle states, three particles, and I look what does the cohomology, uh, what does the um, cohomology of Q pick out of these? And then I would say in the one particle state, I find the chiral fermion. In the two particle state, I find these things. So there, there's some one form and two form field strengths. Uh, it, it's a, a yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I what, what the, probably what one would have to do, because we know what is the super partner of the fermion is the young wheels field. So the young wheels field naturally sits in, in an n equal two word line. So, but perhaps with this resolve formulation, maybe I can somehow embed it in the n equal two. And then maybe I can do it. That we didn't try too hard. Uh, actually, we tried a little bit and failed, but um, uh, perhaps, yeah. Uh, it's really n equal one, but then I cheated by by taking only half of it, which effectively amount uh, promotes it to n equal two. So, so secretly perhaps it is already n equal two. Yeah. So, it I think that's uh, it, it would be yeah. So that that's something that uh, certainly on the agenda to see can we actually get word line? Uh, can we can we get the space time supersymmetry from that? Um, right. Okay, so you find these extra states in the spectrum, and then you can ask, can I deform? Can I introduce them as background fields? Mm -hmm. And again, for this, you need this operator state correspondence, right? So if we have, um, if we can write the, uh, this linearized state as delta Q acting on some reference state, then we say, ah, whatever is in the delta Q is the background field. So that's what we do here. In fact, there is an operator state correspondence. You take this particular state is the reference state here, yeah? and you act with this delta Q onto this reference state, then you reproduce these, these Ramon Ramon states. Hmm. So it's there. So then we know what to do. So then we say, okay, let us deform Q by this in this way and see what equations are imposed by nil potence of the of the BRFD operator. Okay, so so far we just um, <coughs> uh, identified what is the background that creates the state. So in, in some sense this is already nice, right? That you can actually uh, really have a non-linear a, a deformation of the theory by Ramon de fields. It's not just that it arises in the cohomology, but you can really deform it by Ramon de fields. But as Igor would say, of course, there's no word line description of this anymore. I've gone away. The moment I introduced the shift operator, the word line has disappeared. So I'm now purely in an algebraic setup, which is okay for equations of motions. But if you wanted to do uh, Feynman diagrams and loops, uh, it's of course a different story. So that's like if you did, uh, yeah. So anyway, so that is, but you can at least on this algebraic level, we know how to um, couple this to a Mondelman background. And here's a little bit what we find. So now we can start exploring what do, what do these Ramon de background fields do? What is the effect if I switch them on, on this theory? And again, I look at first at this. This is a one form deformation. And so, so uh, let me explain this picture. So this would be the, the trivial vacuum. And I know that F twiddle 
it's a deformation, but it's an exact deformation. Hmm. So at this point, F twiddle is exact, so it's in the cohomology is not there. And the tangent space is there, but in the cohomology is, is, is identified with, the, with a zero. Whereas the F is, um, <coughs> uh, unfortunately, I see I, I put the wrong uh, thing. I should, I, I'll come back to this. Okay, okay let, me, yeah, let me first, I just have a typo here. Let me see, right? The type what I should have written is I deform in this first picture, I deform by this. This one I switch on F alpha beta dot. Uh, this one. So I switch on this, not F twiddle, F. On the next picture, I had it uh, wrong way around. Actually, yeah. So this should be an F here, not an F twiddle. So now, this I said, this is trivial in the cohomology, but this is not trivial in the cohomology. So long it's closed and co-closed, this is a, a, a valid deformation. So what I can do is I can take an infinitesimal deformation and to here and then ask what is, uh, what is, the, what is the cohomology at this new point? What that, mm -hmm. And at the new point, we find that the F-twiddle is not just trivial, it's just set to zero uh, by, the, 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 by the kernel condition. And F is not constrained. So it seems like if you switch on the F, that's fine. It doesn't obstruct, obstruct the F itself. It means F is a linear theory. It can just be switched on. But it affects the F twiddle in, in the sense that in the cohomology, it stays trivial, but it, it's not even the kernel sets it to zero. So I could alternatively, I could deform in this direction. I could deform in this exact direction. And then what will happen is this stays being exact. But what happens is that the F gets mixed up with the F twiddle. They get, you get a linear combination of the, the, the tangent space gets a little bit rotated. So these are the kind of things uh, which you can now discuss. So you can see if you switch on one of the Ramon Ramon fields, how does it affect the other fields? How does it rotate a little bit the cohomology in the space of fields? So, so that's the sort of the, the benefit. So you really have now a nonlinear theory with Ramon Ramon fields where you can start discussing and uh, before I, I mentioned, it also seems to have an effect on um, on the fermions, right? But this I didn't know whether it's it is whether it's uh, consistent that it sets if I switch on the Ramon Ramon field, it sets half of the fermions equal to zero. It might be consistent because you know usually when we do string theory, um, we do this um, this uh, GSO projection. So we throw away at half. We took the GSO projection, which is done a little bit by hand but it eliminates half of the spectrum. So what this would suggest is that the moment you switch on the Ramon Ramon field, actually it forces it to zero by the equations of motion already. That it's not, um, it's no longer a projection, it's just a, the equation already takes care of half of the fermions. But as I said, in order to really make this precise, one should repeat this exercise in 10 dimensions and then compare with string theory. Uh, so that would be things to be done. All right, so I'm actually, how am I going a little bit over time, but I will try to uh, keep it short. So the, the downside here is that all this picture which I've been describing may be appealing or not appealing, but it doesn't seem to derive from an action. So we weren't able to write down an action which leads to this, this, this same picture, space-time action. Yeah. Okay, so maybe that means we are not quite, uh, at the end with this uh, exercise or if, yeah, I don't know. So we, we were not able to find a space-time action. So far. Uh, all right, so now I come back to Igor's um, curiosity. Essentially what I mean is saying that uh, if I'm being scared, uh, what is the fermion that you want to uh, Yeah, that's what I'm trying, yeah. Well, in, in string theory, that's the spin field is precisely that. Now you take the square root of a. Yes, I was confused about the field. Some, uh, field. Uh, in field theory. Yeah, yeah. What the right call that I should have that? Well. I mean, you could perhaps say something similar happens in the in the with the if you compare the Green Schwartz to yeah, so it's it's a bit 
maybe like that, but it's not fringe logs for sure. So we'll, I will come to that question. So now I'm coming back to this question. So now if we started the n equal one word line, we sort of massaged it, we uh, mis mistreated it, and in the end we came up with some theory which we can interpret as some space-time filter from under the Mont field. Could we have written down a word line from the very beginning which would have led to the same theory? Now that's what the pure spinner does. You know, the pure spinner, you start with a word sheet theory which actually produces some of these things. But it's not the RNS theory, it's another theory. Uh, you start with point. So whereas we start with the RNS and then we start in massaging it. So here we ask the same question. W is w so is there a word line theory that would have led to the same theory? And of course, whenever you have a, a BRSD operator, you can always construct a word line theory that gives rise to this BRSD operator simply by t disentangling the constraints that were contained in the BRSD operator, and then you write the action PQ dot plus Lagrange multiplier time constraint, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. and that's what we do. So we we had this, what we do is we strip off this beta because we find that the kernel of Q is the same as the kernel of this operator that I just stripped off the beta twitter. And then I can construct a word line theory by um, exactly PQ dot, and then this is the fermionic part of the PQ dot, and then I add Lagrange multipliers times the constraints. So this is the standard procedure. I should say here I changed variables. I absorbed the shift in the theta shift. So now this is actually bosonic. Everybody is bosonic. This is bosonic, this is bosonic, everybody is bosonic. Okay, and then I, that's fine. And then I can, so I can always construct this theory. The question is, of course, um, What's the spectrum then of this theory? So what is the what, what does it describe? Uh, so what I can do is I can now BRSD quantize again this theory. So introduce Lagrange multipliers as usual, get rid of the constraints, and then I end up with this theory. And so these are the uh, the, the ghosts, the numpy ghosts, for the the constraints. The constraints have uh, gotten rid of, and then. Uh, the BRSD operator is, as usual, ghost times constraint. So that would be the BRSD operator of this theory. And the C alpha, remember the C alpha, I should perhaps denote it again. The C alpha is a first order operator, is this one. C alpha, it's just this. It's just a P slash times lambda. So it's a first order operator. So, and in fact, again, I can look at only half of it, the chiral piece. That is e easily done. You can only gauge half of the the chiral sector. And then the wave functions on which this thing acts are given now by x, theta, bosonic variable, and this ghost. And then in ghost number one, actually, in ghost number one, you find again this Ramon de Mond, um, one form field. So, so you could say this theory also has in the cohomology the same Ramon de Mond one form field as the one that we obtained by massaging the, RN, R, the RNS word line. So, so far so good. However, what didn't work is we cannot introduce it as a background here. So there is no operator state correspondence, or at least we couldn't find one. And therefore I wasn't a, we weren't able to actually introduce, promote this linear fluctuation as a finite deformation. Uh, so this is, is not working. And then maybe as last thing is, can we go back from this theory, which we have proposed here, can we go back to the one that we had before, the, R the massage the RNS? And you can by adding a constraint which relates this ghost, anti ghost, to this lambda times little shift. Again, now this thing you have to be careful because the shift doesn't have nice commutation property. So you can only impose it on the representation space, not as a Lie algebra. You solve the constraint, you get secondary constraints, you do the usual thing. Um, and what you do, maybe that's worth pointing out. So but when you do this constraint, you should say, this was not a ghost. This was just a word line field, and this is a ghost. So you actually impose a constraint, which is inhomogeneous in the ghost number. So then you would say, this makes not too much sense. However, you could also say, let me forget about where this theory came from, and just take it as a theory, a word line theory on its own right, without saying, okay, these are just fields, just word line fields. Without. This is also what the, uh, in pure spinner you do, you know, you say, uh, let's change the interpretation of the word line field. One was a ghost, now it's a field, and you interchange. So then you can actually do that, and you can impose this constraint, and then indeed you get back to this theory, the 
you know, then you reproduce um, then this previous state becomes the one where we had before. So then it, it seems there is a way to go. So so that would be if we wish the analog of the the Brink Schwartz particle or the the, the pure spinner word line for for our uh, massaged RNS signal line. And then, of course, you might ask, does it have anything to do? Maybe we've done just the same thing as, as the pure spinner particle, we just didn't notice. But it seems not, because uh, if I, again, I can change interpretation, I can say lambda, uh, these were previously word line fields, and these were the ghosts. I just changed the role. I say what was, what was ghost before is now field, and the other one is, is ghost. The theory is, of course, the same. Uh, the word line action is the same, and then I make one more change of variable, like this. And then, indeed, um, you come to an action which is a little bit similar to, which looks a little bit similar to the Brink-Schwartz action. If there was, if here, instead of a tau dot, you had a theta, then you would recognize this as, as the, the Brink-Schwartz particle. But it's not. And as a result, you don't have, you know, it looks a little bit like supersymmetry, but not quite, because if this was a theta here, then it would be space-time supersymmetry, but this is not a theta, so it's not it's not space-time supersymmetry. So it's a little bit similar, but not not the same. So okay, well that's just life. You know? And and also this explains perhaps why there is no space-time supersymmetry in our in our in our thing. Right, so I'm coming to the end. I already gone over time. So so it seems like it is possible once you are ready to stand on your ears and uh, do these, all these illegal things to, to, to bring the Ramon de Ramon background into the RNS word line. Um, the sigma model we saw, we can, we can um, write a sigma model that leads to this theory, but we don't know how to deform this sigma model by this back by the Ramon de Ramon background here. So in that sense, it's not so satisfactory and you know, that's a deficiency. And I think it would be nice uh, to repeat this exercise in 10 dimensions, and then we really can compare whether it has anything to do with. Because in, in, in we saw for the nervous schwartz sector, the word line reproduces all the low energy equations of motion of string theory. Mm -hmm. All these supergravity, I mean, not the bosonic part of supergravity, is actually something, how to say, sometimes people say string theory is a great theory because it reproduces Einstein equation. Yeah, well, everybody reproduces Einstein equation. This is there's nothing special. Right? So the word line does it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is not an argument for string theory because the point particle already has all this information. The low energy effective factor is already in the point particle, and it's a little bit I would say disappointing uh, that okay, this is for the after dinner speaks apparently. <laughs> so, but um, so in that sense. Um, it, it would just be nice to understand how much of what we usually do a lot of work in string theory to exact is already contained in the word line. And, and that is really the purpose of this of this exercise. Okay, so I think that's a good good place to stop. Thank you very much. <coughs> Minutes for questions? Before the coffee break. I have one. <laughs> so, why do you think there is any connection with pure spinner? Oh, it's just because um, it's this, you know, I mean, basically, uh, th probably there isn't, but um, because we what we do is we take the, the mu index and then make it into an alpha index. That's, of course, what you do, right? I mean, this this action there is already tells you it's 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 a little bit. I mean, yeah, that's it, really. Yeah, we. we what, what, what would have been nice in a way if you find that you you take the square root of the word line fermion and you get the, the like the the Brink Schwartz action in disguise or so, on. and we say no, not quite. Yeah. And of course, if it was so your spinners, then I wouldn't have. Then I can say, okay, great, <laughs> it's already done. Uh, but but then the connection is more more visual than than uh, technical, right? Um, I mean, well, yes, no. It's a little bit technical in the sense. Remember, in in in, in the 
in the pure spinner, you also start with the BLSD operator of the Green-Schwarz action or the bring schwarz particle. If it's a, and then at some point you say, okay, this is the BLSD operator you, you get, but you really don't like it. So let's only take part of it and continue with that one because it has already the relevant information. And in that sense, it's sort of quietly, it, it's, 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 it's parallel. But, and just, you know what I, it's, it's also perhaps to put it differently. I don't want Nathan to come and say, well, I've already done this. And because if we found that this is pretty short, then probably you would say, okay, well, it's nothing new. <laughs> You've just reformulated something I've already done. It seems like it's not quite the same. And certainly the starting point is different, right? We start with the RNS and try to deform it. The other is starting with bring short. Somehow we start at the other end. But it would still be nice somehow if we can try to do the same thing. So maybe I missed it because I'm a bit sleepy, but uh, what all the interactions are they governed by some homotopy algebra structures? Yes, because um, whenever you have a BRSD, I mean, that, that's actually, um, how to say, it's a comment. Um, so, if what, what, what we do here is basically the following thing. We say we have a bracket. And these brackets act on, you know, and then we have a BLSD algebra, which is, you know, is built up the X or the P of the C of the beta, gamma, and so on, all these things. And then we can build, a, say, a, an object omega, which is some function, some function of this Lie algebra element. And then we can say this is an element. So this is an element in some graded algebra, graded uh, Lie algebra, super Lie algebra. And then we can ask, um, we can Im include this bracket. Now this bracket is, what does it call it? It's a uh, chevalet eilenberg complex, which you can always do for any Lie algebra. And this is, um, th you can say this is a homological vector field. Let me call this perhaps, I don't know, I've used all the letters. Let me call it V somehow. Or perhaps better, uh, I should say, the homological vector field V will be uh, omega stuff. Hmm? So at each point in this Q manifold, which is this element in the algebra, you can uh, um, impose a, a homological vector field. Now, the thing is, um, this will square to zero always when uh, omega, omega is equal to zero, which is precisely what we would call, then, we, then we, if this is satisfied, we call it Q or the Q. Yeah. So basically now, so now you have a homological vector field, which, square, which is homological vector field the moment this is true. Now that then you can say, let's expand it around a certain point. Now we take some point, Q zero, and you expand it around this point. And then these expansion coefficients, if this is satisfied, necessarily give you the structure of a homot homotopy algebra. So basically, well, in, in, in the short answer is whenever you have um, the homotopy, homotopy algebra, is nothing just a statement that Q squared is equal to zero. That, that, that's the only statement that is in the homotopy algebra. So, and, and then you can, of course, expand it. This, you can expand this condition uh, in, in deformations, and then you get Q big quartic and so on. But uh, so homotopy algebra is automatic. Whenever you have BV, you have. Is it, it's automatic. That's pre that would be precisely my wish. That is for the last three years or four years, that's what I've been trying to do is re recover the queue, which gives rise. Could you repeat the question? I it was not question. heard in the, in the back. Yeah. So, <clears throat> oh, I was just wondering whether Okay, you already have the L infinity algebra from string field theory. Yeah. So can you somehow try to take this process backwards and reconstruct the Q um, that, uh, that you're... Uh, yeah, that, I mean, the uh, thing is, uh, how to say, well, normally one does it the other way around. No, normally say if we if suppose we already knew what string field theory was, then we would have an action. We would have a BV action, and we would have a BV bracket, and this would be equal to zero. That was just a statement that the string field theory is consistent, right? And then we could define 
from this, we could define a Q, or let me, yeah, maybe Q. I could define it as S comma. This is homological vector field. So, th and then uh, you could say, let me what now expand. What is that it. squiggle in there? The, the this one is just, I did, let me define it by Q. Okay, so oh, let just me define it by, let S. me define it, sorry, let me define it by V. Let me call it V for now. So this is just, so this is just a dot. So S, the, the, the S anti bracket is some, is some point in the manifold of potential master actions. Is yeah, so this would be a must, this would be the, the, the BV action of string field theory if we had it. Uh -huh. Then we would have uh, an anti bracket because we have the BV action, we have an anti bracket. Then we could say, let's uh, define a vector field being the anti bracket of S with whatever you act on. Uh -huh. And then this is homological because of this. So V squared is equal to zero because of, of this. And then you could say, let's expand it. Now let's expand it around a certain point. Let's say we now write S. Here what we do is you write S as being S of phi zero plus phi minus phi zero S prime and so on. Okay. Yes. Uh, then you would expect, then you would expect, and then what you would give this, this, I mean the, um, then this V, expand V in the same way. Then you would get V is equal to V zero plus V one plus V two and so on. And then these V's in the dual language would sort of have the prop would would ha have the properties of a they would define a homotopy algebra. So string field theory, if it's defined as psi cube psi plus psi psi star psi, star psi and so on, is is this. Okay. Uh, ideally, we would have normally engaged here. We do the opposite, right? We have already our Mills theory. We make it into BV action, and then we expand. So this is uh, some been some exercise recently that you take a theory which is already BV theory, expand, and say, "Oh, we have a multi algebra." Of course, it's just an expansion. So it, it, I guess what you're saying is that it's the analog of what you're trying to do for string field theory is kind of tri trivial. It's really just the master. What the thing that you're calling Q. It would be would be would this. just be the master action of what would be this. So that is what I would call or if, if you like the, uh, the 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 commutator of master action. Yeah. Yeah. So the, so this is the if you wish this translates into the Q zero. This would be the delta Q, and so on. So um, you know, I think Barton many years ago was trying to write an action for the master action. <laughs> so. Maybe that would be helpful for writing an action for your Q. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Of course, possible. Yeah. yeah, but so just so to say that so well, I am. All this work is trying to reconstruct this V. And then once you have V, in principle, you know what is, what is S. Yes. 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 Uh, um, but of course, you could do this perturbatively. Then you would just write it like this. But this, the, 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 the problem with this is that it's perturbative around the certain, you see, whenever you, here, you don't pick a point in the field space. Whereas here, you've already picked a point, Minkowski space, for instance, or uh, no connection or something. When you, you see, this is the V evaluated at metric equal Minkowski, for instance, would be V zero. Wow. So whenever you do homotopy algebra, you already pick the point and you expand around the point. Which is, of course, I think in string theory, it might be the best we can do because we don't really, once we go away from this point, if we go somewhere here, it might not even be a CFD anymore. It might be. Exact, exactly, yeah. So, so we have to pick a point. Right? And that's when the word line, you have the advantage. You don't have to pick a point. You can do it anywhere. And I think it seems, although I must say, I don't really fully understand it, the pure sp in pure spinner, you also seems to have seems to be possible to write down um, this PRSD operator at any point. It seems that that's what I think how and um, Berkowitz is somehow must be doing. So I, I cannot say I fully understand it, but, um, but in the RNS, uh, that is, yeah, the downside of homotopy is you always have to pick a point to expand around. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, I have one question. So, you try to do this with ambiguous strings or, or kind with, of strings? Sorry? 
Have you tried to do this, uh, all these constructions with Ambit Twister string? Oh, that Pyro would be string? my next thing. Yeah, I would actually for two years already, um, I'm, 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 I'd like to do this, but somehow I always get stuck with it. But absolutely, that would be somehow the obvious next thing because it's already a world tree theory, but it's still a point particle. <laughs> yeah, and you can do all these bosonizations on yeah. so this, these things would work there. So you have a, like a more controlled version of this model. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, I should say though that there is a, a paper by uh, um, can I remember the names Adamo, Tim Adamo, and some others. Perhaps Mason even is on it. I'm not sure anymore. Where they actually for the Neuve Schwartz field yeah, they right. construct the Q and also Q squared equals zero gives equations of motion. Yeah, they don't have the dilaton, maybe not the yeah, They have the, the full animation. But indeed, I think the, the obvious thing to do is to see can one do this Ramon Ramon in the in the in the ambit twister. That should be a realistic goal. Yeah. Mm. Although is it there actually? Is Ramon Ramon even there in the ambit twister? No 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 I, they don't they don't know how to couple it. Can you not? Can you not? Uh, in, in no, bas it? basically because the picture changing operator, they they don't know how to deal with it. Not even in the spectrum. No, no in, the, in the spectrum, yes, but but uh, not uh, the couples with background. Oh, I see. Okay. <coughs> no more questions. So we can have. Huh? Uh, are there questions over Zoom? <laughs> I can look myself actually. I'm on Zoom. So. <laughs> I guess no, no one said anything. Let me see. Let me stop broadcasting. I can look at Zoom. Yes, there is. There is? No, there isn't. Is there? Uh, I'm not sure what this is. A chat. Oh, audience cannot be heard. Please repeat the question. <laughs> uh, in the beginning, we didn't have the microphone for the question. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we, we can thank uh, Ivo again and go for the coffee. Uh, thank you.